Well, uh, hello. Uh, here we are at the, um, the annual Leonard Meddy Conference, and in the framework of the Leonard Meddy Conference, uh, the Estonian Council on Foreign Relations it has the uh, honor and pleasure to talk to some special friends of Estonia, and today we have uh, Timothy Garton Ash here, uh, a writer, historian, uh, one-time journalist, I guess. Uh, now you've moved far beyond that, but who is the premier chronicler of uh, European history toward Eastern Central Europe um, of the past 40 years, I would say. 40 years, yeah, that's more or less when you started. And um, we're especially proud that we have uh, here in Estonia, we have his most recent book, which appeared only a few weeks ago, I guess, because I ordered the English language when I saw it, was, is actually appeared in Estonia at the same time, uh, almost. And um, certainly we hope that the Estonians will go and buy it because I think it is a, uh, a crucial book for understanding where we are today and that's what where we came from and so that's what i would like to talk about absolutely well listen it's a huge pleasure to be here um back in estonia i have to tell you um yesterday morning i looked out of my uh, hotel bedroom window and across the harbor and to the gulf of finland and the thought that on both sides of the gulf of finland we now have three countries which are members both of EU and NATO. That's a wonderful thought. And that tells you that something has been achieved in these 50 years. So this, this book took me just 50 years to write. It starts in the early 1970s. If you told somebody who, in 1973, that this is what the Gulf of Finland, that this is what Estonia would look like 50 years later, they wouldn't have believed it, that Estonia would be a sovereign independent country. Fourth on the Human Freedom Index in the entire world. I mean, so that is, it gives me huge delight to, to, to see that. Um, but at the same time, one motive for writing this book was the sense that after this sort of great enlargement of freedom, which I date from the early 1970s, remember Spain, Portugal, and Greece were still dictatorships, through the 80s, 90s, early 2000s to around 2008, We've had since 2008, global financial crisis and Putin's annexation of two chunks of Georgia, what I call the downward turn, a cascade of crises all the way down to the 24th of February, 2022. And the sense that we really have to mobilize to defend what is honestly the best Europe we've ever achieved. Well, this is the, uh, I mean, I have been uh, fixated really on this this 30 year period that began with say 89 91 with the uh with the collapse of communism and the liberation of uh eastern europe especially obviously estonia all of the optimism and i would say it's largely naivete and the illusions of the of uh, the post cold war era as it was called that um, finally had a as you rightly said, a slow decline, but it came to an abrupt halt. It was over clearly, I mean, exactly like September 1, 1939 said, <laughs> okay, we're in a new era. February 24, Estonian Independence Day, by the way, of yeah. uh, 2022. Yeah. That 30 year epoch was over and we're in a new reality. I think we will be spending time looking at what was it that we did wrong. We know what the other guy did wrong, but still, we did a lot wrong as well. A lot, a lot. I mean, when you say September 1st, 1939, I think of W.A. Jordan, the end of a low dishonest right. decade. Right. So I call this period the post war That's a good one. Post-war, post-1945, and post war i.e. after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and I would say that period lasted from the 9th of November, 1989, the day of the fall of the Berlin Wall, to the 24th of February, 2022, and it's a closed period. Right. And, uh, you know, we got many things right, it's worth saying, particularly in the first 15 years of that, the first half yeah. of that period. I mean, the great eastward enlargement of EU and NATO. But I think two mistakes in particular. One was what I call, 
a historiosophical mistake. That is to say, it's like the fallacy of extrapolation. We took the way things had gone so well for a number of years and assumed that they would simply go on going that way. So we took history with a small a, always a product of conjuncture, chance, choice, collective will, individual leadership, and turned it into history with a capital H, a Hegelian, I was about to say, it's Hegel, teleology, is Hegelian that... process of the inevitable advance of freedom. And this was a, this was a huge mistake. We forgot that his freedom is always a struggle, not just a process. The other was, I think, more specific. You know, there are some lessons one can learn from history, particularly when things often repeat in history. And one of them is what happens when empires are in decline. They don't like it. Ask the British, ask the French, ask the Portuguese. And so we made the great mistake of assuming that when the largest land empire in Europe, the Russian Soviet Empire, softly and suddenly vanished away in three years, 1989 to 1991, that was the end of the story. When I say we, by the way, I think Estonians probably didn't make the same mistake, uh, were, but many people in Europe did and in the West did. Now, to some extent, I think it was understandable to try and do a modernization partnership with Russia, that was in a way what we'd promised, that was a deal in 1989-91. But at the latest in 2008, I think we should have woken up and said, aha, we know what's happening, we've learned from history, this is the empire striking back. And if we had sharpened our policy then, and above all after 2014, I don't think we would be in the mess we're in today. I think, yeah, I think the acquiescence of uh, Western Europe and the United States, um, their passivity in response to 2008, 2014, uh, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the mercantilism of, say, for signing Nord Stream 2 in 2015 after the accession. I think the other problem, I mean, one way of looking at it is empire. The other way I, would, I also look at it is that the fundamental mistake we made was thinking that all of the horror of 45 to 89, 91, was a matter of means of production or ownership. It wasn't communism. I got that inkling already with Milosevic, who very quickly became, went from being a communist to a capitalist, but what he did was hor horrific. And I said, uh, I wondered in 93, 94, what happens if Russia does this? I mean, with all its power. But it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't communism that, or just, it was, I mean, communism played a part, it had an ideology, but uh, that justified things. But in fact, communism went away. You know, the greatest uh, Gini coefficient discrepancies in Europe are in Russia. The most kleptocrat, most capitalist country is Russia. It wasn't communism that was that is producing what we see today. Um, and to think that everything was fine the minute that communism collapsed, I think, was a real error. That's right. And in a way, we had it too good. That's to say what happened in 1989 and 1991 went so incredibly smoothly um, and you look back now and you say to yourself this was a one in a million example of historical luck. There's a wonderful phrase from Henri Bergson, the, the philosopher, who talks about the illusions of retrospective determinism, the almost irresistible temptation to believe that something that actually happened somehow had to happen. And I think young Europeans, many young Europeans today, maybe until the, until the war in Ukraine, but certainly until the war in Ukraine, think that this was somehow inevitable. It was anything but inevitable, as was, as you know better than anyone, definitely not inevitable that Estonia should come into the EU and NATO. I, I meet that regularly when I teach in Tartu, where it's kind of seen as a... It was an inevitable thing. Of course we are. And we are so successful. How could they have not taken us? I, mean, I know it was touch and go. So I tell the story in the book of meeting George, President George W. Bush in 2001. Michael McFall and I were summoned to brief him before his first official visit to, to Europe. 
and we were very much urging NATO enlargement on him. Of course, we were only one, two small voices. There were many, many important voices urging this. But what was interesting was his one question back was, and what about the Baltic states? May 2001. So it was still a question for the President Absolutely. of the United States. Well, in fact, uh, from what I understand, his uh, cabinet was quite divided on that. Uh, and it was ultimately his personal decision when, as uh, was told to me by a senior U.S. official, he said, but it's the right thing to do. Clearly, just a, it was a moral decision. It was not a political calculus of defense depth versus all those other things. Well, there's a wonderful Mark Twain line, which I'm sure you know. If you don't know what to do, do the right thing. It's not a, it's not, it's not a bad principle. Um, but, you know, it was interesting because in that conversation, George W. Bush, um, who was no fool at all, uh, he wasn't an intellectual, but he was intelligent. And he had a strategic vision, but the strategic vision was fundamentally about the competition with China. His worldview at that point was, I describe this in the book, that, you know, we've defeated the Soviet Union, but now we have another major geopolitical rival. Now, this is five months before 9-11. After 9-11, everything changes. Everything becomes about uh, Islamist terrorism. China and Russia are seen as allies in that struggle. But actually, looking back, he was much more right then. Well, we have the, the GWAT, or the Great War of Terror, yeah. it seems to have been it's dissipated. Absolutely. And what's so fascinating, too, is do you remember we thought 9-11 would change everything? That was a huge Titan vendor, to kind of no, phrase it, was a historic <laughs> turning point. Actually, when you look back, you look over this period, it's a turning point in Middle Eastern history because of Iraq. It's a turning point in U.S. history, partly because it launches the U.S. on what Richard Haas calls a decade of strategic distraction. But it's not really the great turning point in European history. In my view, I think it's 2008. Well, I wish Europe would see that more today. I mean, Western Europe would see that more today as well, that that was the bigger error to not to react to that. Well, thank you for coming, uh, visiting Estonia again. I urge all of my compatriots to go to the store, buy Timothy's book, available in Estonian. This is one of the things that really uh, also makes me extremely happy. I'm proud. hugely impressed. The speed with which they brought that out is just astonishing. So uh, it's, um, I mean, we... For self-evident reasons, books that touch upon foreign policy and history have a big readership in this country. So, thank you, Tim. Great pleasure.